All right, all right, all right. Hello. Hello. Let's do this. Let's do this. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I know that we stand between you and the party and the beer. And we are the pre-party. Uh, what's that? We are the party. Okay. Um, uh, the pre-party, the, you know, the warm-up for the party. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, we are going to be talking about cryptography, which is, why not? It's the end of the second day of the conference, and your brains are probably filling up a little bit, and we're going to do our best to top them off. However, um, every cryptography talk I've been to, uh, I usually fade out right around the fifth or sixth slide, math equations, and my brain sort of dumps. So what I thought would be fun for this talk is to bring along John Skeet, who works um, some tech company. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, some big company. Um, I'm Rob Connery, I work at Microsoft. John's gonna write some code today. We're gonna be talking about why SSL and SSH are secure, not in terms of like the high-end stuff, but the low-end algorithms, like how do, so, how do those algorithms actually work? Um, my role here today is to talk a little history and to ground things in concepts. John's gonna write some code. And heckle. I mean, let's, like, let's just hijack already, okay? <laughs> so. The only reason Rob has me up here is so that I'm not heckling from down there. But this will not work. I will heckle from up here. Um, and also, I've noticed, like, I haven't been to conferences for a little while, uh, but I've been in talks today, and until questions at the end, of which there haven't been many, it's been almost silent. So I'm, like, instituting a rule. If no one has interrupted us and asked a question or something after about each 10 minutes, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to mute Rob's mic if I can reach it. <laughs> um, so we demand interaction. Okay? Yep. yep. Good. Please do. Um, I, the reason I'm showing this lovely chap's face uh, right now is because if you went to his talk yesterday, he talked about TLS handshakes. Uh, we are going to have a little overlap, but I'm going to go more into the RSA algorithm. That's what we're talking about today. And before I go farther, anybody in here know what the RSA algorithm is? Aside from you all. This is exciting. <laughs> really? Okay. Is it South Africa's constitution? It is not South Africa's constitution. Thank you, Mr. Rendell. <laughs> so the RSA algorithm is really interesting. It is uh, arguably, but I'm going to make the claim, the most important algorithm ever created. It is the most downloaded software ever made. It is the thing that helps put the lock in that bar up there. Um, of course, the cryptographers in the room would tell me, well, Rob, that could be ECDSA, blah, 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 blah. It's all based on RSA, and RSA is the thing that kicked it off. Uh, encryption, encryption over the years, the dream of encryption was to have secure communication from point A to point B. It was only until 30 or 40 years ago that that became a reality through RSA. The question that you might be wondering is, who cares? Why do I need to care, right? No, everyone's wondering why we've got like that weird Mask, mouse, whatever. Oh, no, that's, that's, that's Errol. That's my kid's drawing. I have to put one of my kid's slides in every talk I do. So this okay. is, this is Errol, cool. by the way. Um, so why do we care? Because history is important. Cryptography is part of everything that we do, or a pillar of everything that we do. And sometimes learning the history of the code that you write can connect the dots in your head. And someday you might be sitting there thinking, hmm, I remember Diffie Hellman. I remember this and that. Wow, OK, and you make some connections, and it's great. The other reason is a quote that I read in a magazine article that said 80% of corporations don't know the algorithms that are used to protect their digital data, which is a little scary. So hopefully today, you're going to know a little bit more. Um, we're going to get to the code in just a minute. I do have a preamble I have to get to. Let me get to it. We're on a tight schedule, Skeet. Um, <laughs> Cryptography is actually two things at once, and it's really important to know this. Cryptography is both encrypting things and decrypting things, and they're both equally important. Um, it's kind of a cop-out to think about decrypting things, hacking, cracking, right, as the black hat way of doing things. It is almost more important than the encryption aspect, but then you get in fights about that. Decrypting things is the way the Allies won World War II, by breaking Enigma. It is really important, so whoever can break the other side wins. That's important to keep in mind. So let's talk about cryptography real fast. If you're in uh, Mr. Helm's talk, we talked about the Caesar cipher. Um, I'm going to start my talk here today with that. The Caesar cipher is one of the most basic ciphers out there. With this, we get to learn two things. We get to learn the cipher, which is the algorithm, and then we get to learn the secret or the key that tells the algorithm what to do and how to behave. So here, the Caesar cipher is basically just pushing ahead certain characters in the alphabet. So NDC London, 
you spin that little dial five uh, points forward using the key, and then you end up with SIH, QT, SIH. Or you attend the party. I reckon this is pre-party speaking and post-party speaking. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly right. So in this, um, in this, we get our first introduction to the idea of is, does the cipher matter or does our secret matter? Does the key matter more? Which do you think matters more? Does anybody have any idea? Care? All right, be quiet. I know beer's coming. <laughs> the key is the important thing. And I'm going to come back to this more and more, but the key is the thing that we want to keep safe because the key is the, are, are the settings for the algorithm. In the same way that if you lock your bike to a railing somewhere and you have a key and you have a lock, you can think of the lock as the algorithm, the key is going to unlock and lock it. Now, if you asked an engineer which was the most important thing in those, in that, those combinations, they might say, well, the lock's got to be secure and awesome and amazing. And I would say, well, the key is going to get you home because you're going to be able to unlock the bike and you're going to get home. So to cryptographers, the key is the key. The key is everything. We're going to come back to this more and more. And you're going to be able to write code in just a second, I promise. It's OK, I'm just tweeting. OK, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> as, engineers, as engineers, we don't want to hear that, you know, what do you mean? The algorithm's the important thing. This, the settings, the key, why is that important? And the answer is that we have been trying to find algorithms that are unbreakable forever. Except there is one, and I'll get to that in a second. We've been trying to find answers to algorithms forever. As engineers, we think we can write great code. I can scramble the hell out of anything. OK, a lot of people have tried. In this MIT article, they're still looking for the idea of an unbreakable cipher. They don't know if one exists, which is fascinating. However, there is one that exists, but it's highly impractical. And Skeet's going to actually write this for us in a second. It's called the one-time pad. This is Claude Shannon in the 40s. He mathematically proved that it is an unbreakable cipher, which is fascinating. And this QR code, by the way, if you want a great read for the train ride home or the flight home, uh, this is his biography. It's called A Mind at Play. The man is a towering genius. Uh, a lot of people have said his contributions to the world uh, eclipse Einstein's as far as our life goes. He invented it's all everything. It is all relative. Good one. I know. You are going to destroy this talk, aren't you? All right. <laughs> So let's see how a uh, one-time pad works. Uh, then Skeet's going to write it for us. It uses this thing called modular math. If you've ever used the mod operator in your code, the percent sign, uh, that percent sign is the remainder of the mod operator. So if you, uh, yeah, if you use that, you get the remainder of some division operation. Um, thinking about it as modular math, those terms are kind of weird. You say clocks, it's kind of weird. But if you think about our Caesar cipher, this is mod 26, because there's 26 letters. If we keep going and spinning that dial, we're going to start over at the beginning, start over at the beginning. So if our key is 17,212,000 and change, the neat thing about that is we're still going to get letters out of there. And there's still going to be letters we understand. Just keep starting over and over and over. Why do we care about modular math? Because it creates for us a function that cannot be determined by looking at its output. So here, I have an algorithm. Let's call it a cipher. It's function f. And by looking at the output, I can pump numbers into this function. Because remember, the cipher is not the important thing. And Kirchhoff's principle is something that Shannon talked about uh, in his career. The enemy knows the system. They know your algorithm. They know your cipher. They're going to hack into it. They're going to steal it from you. They know your cipher. What they don't know is the key. But here, looking at this function, I can look at the output here, pump this thing full of numbers, and I can figure out what's happening inside, and then I can also figure out what the key is. So x right here would be 4, right? Looks like a squaring operation to me. If we use modular math, however, clock math, and I use the remainders, uh, what we get instead is what's called a one-way function. So here you look at, the, I'm showing you the key, by the way, but if you look at the output, you have no idea how you got that. And this is something that cryptographers love, because you can put numbers and you can put values into a thing. It basically spins a dial, and you don't know how you got there. This, by the way, is the function, x squared mod 12. So if you're having trouble figuring out what mod means, if we do x squared mod 12 here, we get the very first function. We get a function uh, or 4 squared, which is 16, divided by 12. You get 4 left over. So that's how modular math works. All right, Mr. Skeet. OK. Uh, if we could switch over to the second laptop. Yes. Fingers crossed. Hurrah. OK. Uh, I have created a solution with six projects. We hopefully won't need six things. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so Rob talked about doing this with alphabets. I have written all this code using actual alphabets, um, but it ends up taking more time than we would probably want. So I'm going to start off just with 
encrypting some bytes using a one-time pad. Um, now, Rob would probably like to say that the pad that we use should be at least as long as the message that we want to encrypt. Right. And basically, we're going to take each byte of the message and add a value from the one-time pad and do it mod 256. Um, and that will be the encrypted byte for that byte. Go along all our bytes, one byte of input and one byte from the pad, another byte of input, a separate byte from the pad. If we use the same byte the whole way along, like the Caesar cipher with six right. was like having a one-time pad of six, 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 six. That's a really boring key. Yep. Um, so we're just going to generate yeah, that's, a nice... Yeah, I, I skipped over that a little bit. That's what the pad is. The pad is a very long, you can think of it as a long set of numbers. If your first message, you spin it from the alphabet to numbers, and then you have a pad that is a second set of numbers, and you have a bunch of pads. You can't reuse them, they're all random. You add those together and that's your cipher, that's it. See, a really professional presenter would uh, try to have sort of introduced that without mentioning that Rob had forgotten to mention it, but um, like, <laughs> if you want that, you shouldn't have got me. Yeah. Right, so we're going to first get a random pad, and you know, this is obviously really important that this code is massively secure, so we're not just using system.random, that's you know, very pseudo-random, random number generator is rather better. Um, and I'm gonna start off- Are you still using Copilot? Uh, yeah, probably. I'm going to turn the Wi-Fi off for the moment uh, so that it doesn't produce anything. I like it. Um, so I'm going to do two versions of this. Um, one is the old school way. And then I'll do it a bit funkier. So let's strongly type that so that you can, or rather, uh, explicitly type it so we can see what's going on. And then we're going to have an encrypted version, which is going to be the same length as the uh, message. And aside from anything else, from this talk, you must take away, do not ever write your own encryption. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just never, ever a good idea. Um, and encrypted. I is going to be message I plus pad I, and then we're just going to cast it to byte. And for any C sharp geeks in the audience, we are in a default unchecked context, so it's not going to overflow. Yes, Pilchy, I'm looking at you. Um, so that should be fine. Um, and then we've got an encrypted byte array that we can send along. And then as Rob mentioned, there's the second half of it, which is decrypting. And to decrypt, we just say, instead of adding the pad, we subtract the pad from, this time, from encrypted. So if the original byte was three and the pad, the corresponding pad element was five, we'd have eight in the encrypted thing, so we need to take five away to get back to three. And then we're just gonna um, write at the end, encoding dot string, oh, UTF-8, get string, uh, decrypted. And fingers crossed, that should still print, hi Rob, how's it going? Do -do -do. We got some shots riding on this. <laughs> if his code doesn't work, he has to do shots. Okay, yeah, all right. It worked. <laughs> uh, now, just, just so that there's some more funky stuff, um, this is all a bit long-winded, uh, we can do better with link and a C sharp feature that I only saw like a couple of days ago. I'm not quite sure why. Um, we can use instead of encoding .utf8 .get bytes, we can use the funky u8 kind of mm. string literal, and this is now a read-only span of byte. And well, you instead can't... of It's all, yeah, it's all, all goodness, and there are a number of places that I now want to start using this. Um, and then instead of like, explicitly creating the byte array and stuff, we can just say var encrypted, assuming that um, read only span implements i enumerable and stuff, doesn't it? Uh, we can zip the message with the pad saying for any given a and b, just go to uh, byte a plus b. Ah, a comma, thank you. And then, yeah, let's um, 
turn it back into an array. So, do do do. Uh, let's. Oh no. Ha. Okay. <laughs> having having got it as a read-only span, I'm sure there's an as enumerable or something. Like let's just create the byte array out of it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine. And then the decryption ends up being just as straightforward. We, we take decrypted is encrypted because we don't have the plain text message anymore. So you know a good coder presenter would make sure his code worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fine. And so now much more. Is it going to go? Is it going to go? Is it going to work? Woo! All right. Okay. Well done. Good job. Anything more on this one or are we? Nope. We are good to go. Back to laptop one, please. All right, so here's the super simple form of using the one-time pad. If I wanted to send a message to Skeet, we both have a pad book. All, it has uh, all the keys we're ever going to use. Let's say for a given month. Skeet goes away, and then I call him up one day and use pad 24. Even if someone intercepts that message where I say use pad 24, it, they don't know what those pads are. So that's why it's unbreakable. And so Skeet would just look at that, and we'd be able to use it, and it's wonderful. The only problem is what happens if the pad book is stolen? Well, then you're done. And it's, that's what makes this impractical, especially for public encryption. It is unbreakable, but it's not really usable by everyone. Because has I, have I mentioned that the key is the key? Um, this was never more obvious when it came to World War II. Um, and this right here is an Enigma machine that the Allies stole from the Nazis when they captured the trawler Polaris up in Norway. And they captured the book. Uh, excuse me, they captured the Enigma machine, but they got the books, the instruction manuals. They got the actual keys for the entire month. It was a gold, it was a gold mine. And so what they did is, they, this is the actual, um, these are the actual key settings that they stole. There were two days left in the calendar months. And what these two gentlemen, Gordon Welchman and Alan Turing, were able to do, were they able to listen to the traffic coming in. And they decrypted the messages, of course, but they looked at each message, then they looked at the keys, and they thought, is there a way that we can figure out how they're generating these keys? And sure enough, there's a setting called the Grundstelling, which is the first three characters of the first daily message. And Alan Turing had a leap of faith, and he thought, you know what? I bet that the operators never reset the rotors after they did the, early, every, uh, the key every morning. I bet they're still in that key position. So and no, he was right. OK, I'm intrigued. Did, did you say, if you go back to the previous slide, yep. is it November? October. Yep. Yeah, so 30 days. April, June. No, no, 31 days. 31 days. Yeah, so if they got it in February, there wouldn't have been two more days, and we'd have been a whole different war. <laughs> Are we doing dates again, Skeet? What's up? <laughs> now, if they're in the time zone in the uh, Australia somewhere, yeah. Minutes. I know, right. <laughs> but anyway, this is fascinating. They were able, Alan Trang from this was able to realize they weren't resetting the rotors. And from that, he was able to give his computer the bomb. Christopher in the imitation game, if you saw it, he was able to give it a primer. That one mistake by the Germans was, uh, led them to be able to crack the key, which helped us win the war, which is and, crazy. And a subtle design mistake in the Enigma machine that said it will never, like, imagine you had the one-time pad that I've just had that had a, a byte for everything. Some of those bytes would be zero, which means that the output of the encryption for that one byte is the same as the input. The Enigma machine, made sure that would never be the case, which means there's only a key space of 255 instead of 256. Mm. So uh, that apparently made the maths easier for Turing. Yeah, OK. Did it need to be easier? I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> the point, yeah, so the point again, the key, right? So that's what crypto cryptographers have been focusing on for so very long. How can we make a secure key? And it wasn't until the 70s with these three gentlemen at Stanford uh, American University, thank you very much. Um, Whit Diffie, uh, Martin Hellman, uh, and Ralph Merkel, they thought about this idea, and they had been working on this mode, if you will, of keeping a key safe, and they had this idea. What if we use the idea of a two-lock box, right? And this is just kind of a generalized philosophical thing. Like, if I wanted to send Skeet my buried treasure, you didn't see the slide, did you? You should have 
<laughs> right, from now on, for the time that this slide is up, you have to speak like a pirate. Oh, okay. <laughs> if someone gets me a beer, I just might. Um, so the idea here is if I wanted to send Skeet some, some information like my treasure. Right? Arr. Arr. Yeah, it, I, I would lock, the, I would lock the, the chest with my lock, and then I would send somebody over to your ship, and then you would lock your lock on it, send it back to me. Arr. And then I would take my lock off, send it back to him, he'd take his lock off. So... Ideally, no one could get into that. And so that's what the, that's what the diffie hellman Merkel team was trying to figure out. How can we make a key work like that? And the problem is with encryption, you can't do that. Because if I was to encrypt a message and send it to him, and he was to decrypt, or encrypt it on top of that, well, then how do I unencrypt that? That doesn't quite work. Well, anyway, one late night, uh, Martin Hellman had an idea. And it just kid him like it does in mathematics. And he said, I think I, think I can do this. I think I can figure this out. And he came up with this equation right here. And so he's going to actually do uh, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange in just a second in code, but I need to go over the concepts here because it's not obvious looking at the math. And I don't think anyone in here knows who these three people are. Probably. Yeah. Yay, three's company. All right, there's some older folks. I like it. When you're talking about cryptography, you need to talk about Alice, Bob, and Eve. It's three names that come up all the time. Alice and Bob are trying to send each other messages. Eve is trying to eavesdrop. And so what they decide to do for the Diffie-Hellman, they're going to use Diffie-Hellman now, I'm going to represent the math using paint. This is a very common way to explain this. So the first thing that Alice and Bob do is they decide we want to have a very large number that we're going to base our key off of. So I'm representing this by the color red. Now, this isn't just any color red. It's a very particular shade of red that they have figured out down to the molecular level, like very, very big numbers here is that what we're talking about. So this is the public key. They've both decided red. Eve is, Eve's laughing. She's like, you guys are idiots. I can hear what you're saying. She's eavesdropping. She knows that the starting color is red. So what Alice does, she's got a private key that's sitting there. No one can see it. She adds a very precise amount of her paint to the red paint. This is the public key. Very precise. And this is uh, down to the molecular level again. The next uh, step here is that Bob does the exact same with his private key, which is blue. And Eve can't see this. These are hidden. A very precise amount. And so now they've got this weird purple color and weird pink color. And then they do something very strange, which is they exchange the paint cans. And Eve is like, what are you doing? I can see the colors. These people are idiots. How is this at all secure? She knows red is the primary, or the, not the primary key, <laughs> databases. My mind is always <laughs> database. Red is the public key, uh, big number. And then from that, we have purple and we have pink. And she's like, I can figure this out. And then now, this comes the secret sauce, or this is where we get the secret sauce with Divi Hellman. Alice adds her public key, or her private key to Bob's paint and turns it this weird lavender color, and Bob does the exact same thing. And they now have the exact same colors. And you gotta remember, this is math now. These are big numbers. These aren't just willy-nilly paint things. And I know some folks that say, well, I stick it down to the hardware store. I could figure out how they did this. I know the shades. You'd have to be exact. This couldn't be a guess, because every time you try and get a shade of paint copied, it's close, but not exactly the same. So this is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Off to you. Can you switch the monitor, please? Is he still there? There, yes. OK. Uh, so if you go back, you folks can't see the laptop, but I can from here. Go back so that I can see the, I see the need to memorize the formula is a bit much. Right, so it's uh, formula is y to the x mod p. Y to the x mod p. Mm -hmm. Okay. P is the public key. So p is the public key. So is that the generator as we have the generator pulled it elsewhere? Is so I have I have some uh, I have a yeah. So we have we've got a generator and a modulus. Mm -hmm. um, and I called it almost the same thing as in my. So Alice and Bob still need to um, configure. They need to agree some stuff beforehand, mm -hmm. but that can be all public. Like as yep. much as is public is is absolutely fine. Um, and Alice um, needs a private key. Mm -hmm. Shall we uh, name a really big number? Shall we have three? Sure. Yeah, three is good. Um, Three's company. So that's that's, that's her private key, yeah. Yep. And um, Bob has a private key of like that's five. Okay. Okay. So 
we need to do that. Wow, okay, this is, um, I, at Rob's behest, <laughs> this is his sort of background heckling me, yeah. uh, he decided to ask me to install GitHub Copilot. So let's just see what it, what it has done. Is this correct? I, I don't know. I think it, it may well be. Like, <laughs> I, I think it's actually better than my handwritten code. Let's just check this. <laughs> my handwritten code, I'm pretty sure I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know about um, ModPal. But uh, create public key. Yeah, so we take the generator, um, raise it to the private key mm -hmm. power, yep. and then mod it, uh, which apparently, assuming this does actually compile, yeah. Uh, mod modulus division on a number raised to the, it's, it's almost like this should have been called Diffie-Hellman helper. Um, <laughs> so, awesome. Yep. And in other news, Rob knows that from now on he doesn't need me at all. <laughs> um, so, we can get uh, the public key from the private key. So, if our Alice public key, config.getPrivate, uh, get public key, um, and, okay, we've used integer, but, yeah. All of this bit. Later on, we get some stuff that isn't as easy to do uh, with big integer, but for the moment, we're fine. So Alice gets her public key that she can send to Bob. Bob gets his public key that we can uh, send to Alice. And then we need a message. So I'm going to come back to this in a sec, uh, but let's make our message not hi, hi Bob, Rob, how's it going, but a number. Like, okay. 124. Uh, message equals 124. Now let's see whether it actually also gets shared secret. Oh, no, I think we need we need sort of encrypt and decrypt. Yes. Point, don't we? Yes. Right, so Alice is sending the message to Bob. Yep. So uh, we're going to say uh, Alice, um, plain text and um, encrypted is going to be, we'll ask the config to do it again, uh, encrypt the plain text using uh, Alice's private key. Now, you haven't told me how the, how the mixing happens. You've told me like how we get the public key from the private key. That's the mob cow bit. <laughs> Should we just cheat and look at the code that I'd already got rather than switching back? Yeah. <laughs> it's basically... <laughs> I've done this in JavaScript. I did C Sharp. I'm a little bit lost on. <laughs> uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah, we're not, we're not actually going to um, do the encryption. We're going to get finding the shared secret, so the color of paint mm. that we know, um, which actually is exactly what uh, Copilot suggested. So we're going to do... Um, Copilot, man. And a shared secret equals config dot get shared secret. Given our private key and... Bob's public key, because Alice knows her private key yep. and doesn't know Bob's, and Bob's shared secret. So we assume that the actual encryption and decryption, once we've got a shared secret that Eve can't know, we can almost use kind of anything to anything. do that. That's right. um, like the, the, it's almost like the key is the key. The key is the key. Very good. Um, Eric Lippert uh, had something amazing to say. I tried to find the, uh, the, the exact quote but he gave a brilliant quote that says, cryptography isn't so much about keeping things secret, it's about minimizing the amount of information you need to share in order to then make everything else secret. It's mm -hmm. like, if you can just share a small amount of data instead of a huge one-time pad, then cryptography lets you do the rest securely. Um, so now, all we're going to prove is that Alice's shared secret and Bob's shared secret are the same. And I need to change project. <laughs> it's fine. It's I shall pre-do this for next time. Uh, it's all the way down there. Do, do, do. And yeah. they, they both share 19. Um, I haven't bothered printing out what the, um, what the public key and the private key are, but yeah. yep. we've got to the same secret, despite the fact that no, none of the code using Alice's shared secret needs to use Bob's private key. It needs Alice's private key and Bob's public key, mm -hmm. and vice versa. So, very good. Eve is sad. Eve is very sad. Uh, can you switch us back, please? 
There we go. So when the Diffie-Hellman key exchange came out, it, it, it blew up cryptography. It was an amazing achievement uh, back in the 70s. They published the paper, and they had accomplished something that for millennia, cryptographers have been trying to do, which is to have a secret key. But it did have some downsides. Um, one of the downsides was that you needed to be online at the same time. So to share the secrets back and forth, like starting number, big number, and so on, you had to be online at the same time, but that was not a big deal. In fact, today, diffie hellman Key Exchange is still used, uh, modified and whatever for uh, different uses for today, but it's still used. It's a good way of doing things, but it's not great for the masses. And that's when we come to more of a modern time. Uh, this is Whit Diffie again, and he was thinking about this, and he's like, isn't there a way that we can do this asynchronously? Because we have this way that we've proven mathematically we can create a secret key, but what if I could just have my own public key, and if you wanted to send me a message, you could. And you could use my public key in a one-way function uh, to encrypt your data and send it to me. And then I secretly have my own other function that would decrypt it. This is called asymmetric key encryption, which is probably a term you've heard before but might not have understood. So all this does is it uses the same function as Diffie-Hellman with a few modifications, um, but you have a public one-way function, which is your key, but it, you cannot decrypt with it. It's a one-way thing. And you come up with a scrambled mess, you send it to the person you, who you have their public key, you send them the message, and then they shove it through another one-way function. So the interesting thing about this is Whit Diffie is kind of like, well, Skeet and I on this. He knew that it was possible because it's, there's math that could do this. He just had no idea how to do it. And so what he did is he wrote a paper about it and he published his, his idea and he kind of challenged the mathematics community to come up with this. Like, I know there's a function out there that will allow us to use this public key one way and then a private key another way and then to decrypt what has been encrypted. He should have just asked ChatGPT. <laughs> or GitHub Copilot, if they had that. Well, you saw it right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so many years of effort saved. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, I hope my boss is watching this. <laughs> <laughs> I hope mine isn't. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, so it wasn't until a few years later that these three, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Len Edelman, uh, tackled this challenge. And they read this paper, and it was kind of this thing that people were working on, because everybody sensed that you could do this. But it took some number theorists at MIT to really dig into the math and to come up with this equation. Um, and it was groundbreaking and amazing. However, before we get there, yeah, yeah I knew I was going to be heckled if I didn't bring this up. Uh, these two lovely chaps up at GCHQ, up at Bletchley, figured this out four to five years before uh, the Diffie-Hellman crew before RSA. They figured out how to do asymmetric key encryption, and it's a funny, funny story. Uh, this guy, James Ellis, was laying awake at night. He's like, I wonder if I could do blah, blah, blah. And he came up with all of Whit Diffie's ideas. And then he posed it to the other mathematicians up at GCHQ, uh, and, which is Bletchley, right? That's just, yeah, it's just like the... Also down the road. Also down the road, yes, MI6, yeah. Anyway, um, he posed it, and it was kind of sitting there, bouncing around inside the walls, and these other mathematicians would play with this. He'd try and figure it out, because they all thought that you could do this. And then Clifford Cox comes along day one. I think it was on his lunch break. Took him a half hour. Boom, figured it out. Asymmetric key encryption, five years ahead of uh, RSA, which is pretty funny. I have to say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said either of those things. Like, that does not make you look like a normal, nice human being. Like, I solved it just like that. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit, I have a nice proof, but it's too small to fit in the margin. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. No. Firm that, very good. <laughs> Um, yeah, so being, being uh, the government, uh, they found out about this and they slapped it top secret. Uh, we're going to come back to this idea because this is what happens in cryptography a lot. If there's a breakthrough, people figure stuff out uh, and it happens to be the government, boom, top secret. Because cryptography, things like this, are you've got to keep them to yourself. Um, and so they, they sealed this until 1997 and that's when the British were like, ha, ha, ha. Is that what you guys do? Isn't that the sound you make? No. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Pip, pip, pop. Whatever. Sorry. I promised him I wouldn't do it, but I just had to. Sorry. I had to do my best English accent. I don't know. There was something. What, what was it about RSA that you were you were whispering something to Pilchy, and I'm sure it was more interesting than what, than what Rob was saying. But uh, it's not repeatable. Oh. Okay. Uh oh. Right. <laughs> One way pad of its own kind. <laughs> Thing. It's yeah. fine when it's between two friends, but it's, it's, it's not for a room full it's, of strangers. It's a joke I'm allowed to make and Mark's allowed to make to yes. me, but not in public. Okay. <laughs> Later then, please. <laughs> right. 
Right. Okay. We yeah. So how did they do this? How did the how did the RSA team do this? They're, they're from MIT. They're very smart people, and um, they did it with primes. They did it with prime numbers, very large prime numbers. And to understand this, we have to kind larger of larger than five. Larger than five. <laughs> we have to kind of wind our way into understanding how they knew that primes could go into making this unbreakable, virtually unbreakable encryption scheme using a derivation to Diffie-Hellman. So. Mr. Skeet's going to walk us through some prime fun time uh, because RSA uses two primes to make a semi-prime. That semi-prime is the public key. But why do we care? And John's going to tell us why. I, I, am, I, am I going to write the code to generate primes first, or are we skipping? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we're going to write two algorithms. Right, sorry, thanks. I can only hold one thing in my head of what yeah. I'm going to Just to be clear, what? John's going to demonstrate how to get a semi. <laughs> <laughs> Is that an English thing? It is. <laughs> okay. American says, all right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, could okay. we switch, please? So we're going to pretend this is an interview question. Mr. Skeet, welcome to Google. I'd like you to write an algorithm that will do primes up to some, let's say, 10,000. Oh, 10,000. Well, uh, you know, I'm going to Or some number N. How's that? that Returns big integers because I like them. Um, generate primes. Does anybody here know this algorithm? How to do civ for primes? Oh, Where's I'm mine? skipping civ. Like we haven't got time for. Oh. That. We're nearly halfway through. Well, uh, sorry, we're over halfway through. Well, um, so like it's wanting to do stuff. I'm not going. <laughs> yeah. to. No, no. Um, Should we see if which one's better, your code or Copilot's? Yeah. Mm, let's not. <laughs> 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 um, in fact, yeah, we'll just, uh, we, we don't need big integers go on forever, primes go on forever. Um, so big integer. Prove it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so um, if our candidate is prime, we are just going to yield it. And let me just. There might be a better way of disabling GitHub Copilot, but turning the network off works fine. <laughs> no, we've got you now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so now we need to write is prime. Um, and the, the simplest way is just to keep going until the square root of the candidate um, and see whether anything is um, a divisor factor. Thank you. Uh, so, bizarrely, uh, while true, again, um, no, no, we'll have a yeah, uh, possible factor again, big integer, and it would be potentially nice if we only tried to divide by primes, but that would involve more storage to remember all the primes we found so far. So I'm not going to bother with that. Um, so. Uh, divrem is candidate. There's no square root in big integer, which annoys me. Um, so in a previous version of the code, which I can show you, um, on every iteration, I checked whether the square of it was bigger than the square of our possible factor. And that's pretty um, annoyingly uh, inefficient. So let's see if we do candidate uh, divrem. Oh, come on. You've got mod pal, but not div rem? What? Like, <laughs> OK. Is it the static method on the big integer? Yeah, maybe. Thank you. Check out the big brain on Mark. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Do you want to swap that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. You could drive the semi. I don't know the math. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. It's fine. <laughs> right. So. Um, if the like, if this is a square number like four, um, we'll end up with a remainder of zero, mm -hmm. but the quotient is two, um, and so because the remainder is uh, yeah, we're okay if it has got a remainder of zero. It's definitely not a prime, even if it has reached the square root. So if R 
uh, is zero, and there's probably a dot is zero or something to avoid the um, promotion, we're just going to return no, it's not. Um, if Q is uh, greater than, so uh, da, 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 da. if we've reached the stage where the result of the division, so let's take, let's say we're testing seven and we've divided by three and found a quotient of two, um, and that's okay, so we move on to dividing by four, but hey, at this point, we've, got, we've gone past the square root, sorry, we're dividing 10 by three and then by four. Um, when the quotient ends up greater than what we were dividing by, then we've gone over the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I'm just trusting you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so if we've got as far as this, and I think it's less than, in fact, if so we're dividing by greater and greater things, so our quotient goes down, and when they've um, gone past each other, then we've reached the, um, the square root. So that's fine. Otherwise, possible factor plus plus. And... Do you want to just test two and then do odds? Sorry, what? Do you don't want to just test two and then do odds? Uh, well, I, I originally had uh, yield two, th two and three, and then go for every six plus and minus five, um, but nah. <laughs> I, I'm already risking it. Um, sure. um, let's just print the first 10. Okay, out of interest, who reckons this is gonna work? <laughs> One, okay, a few, okay. I'm honestly on the fence myself. Because this isn't the code that I've written before. <laughs> it's John Skeet. Oh. <laughs> wow. It ain't lying. Uh, so. Startup project? No, you got it set. I re it must be that the. Right. Do you know, I'm going to go back to not trying to be fancy. Uh, while. Uh, I'm regretting the length of this variable name now, but that's fine. Um, so if we find a candidate is an impossible factor zero, return false, and now if we get, I, I'm pretty sure it was my on the spot um, decisions about what would end up being a square, um, whereas this will be inefficient, but I'm more confident it will work. I am incrementing the right thing, yes. Okay. <laughs> what we're missing <laughs> is I++ plus plus here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, but it should still have printed two the first time. Very good, yeah. very good. Right. Um, and we could, like, get a fairly big one. Let's just... Uh, Element at, like, let's find the hundred thousandth, or that's probably hundred thousand and oneth, but there we go. And this will take a little bit longer, but. It's underscoring the point of why they use primes. There we go. So that took a while. That took, what did you say, two, three seconds? Three yeah, I mean, this is incredibly inefficient code, right, but right, yeah. Right. <laughs> So we have a part two to this, but I just want to point out that the reason that we're going through this exercise is one, deriving primes, yeah, it takes a while. You can pre-fill a bunch of tables, but the primes that these people are working with are these days 2048 bits long. They're 608 integers, so they're big. So to actually just get that number would take... It would take this a very, very, very long time. Very, very long time, yeah, so we just give up. So, but the secret sauce behind all this, the reason they're using the primes is they, they come up with this big semi-prime, which is the product of two primes. And the trick here is, that's your public key, that's all it is, is that semi-prime. The trick here is, 
trying to figure out what two primes made that semi-prime. And there's only, as far as we know, one way to do it. There's a couple algorithms you can use, I'll touch on in a bit. But this is when you get to talk about prime factorization. And the only way you can do this is to loop through all the primes and match them. Are we going back to your... Nope, nope, I'm we just giving a preamble right, here, okay. a preamble to what we're trying to do. So now what Skeet's going to do is prime huh. factorization, right? Well, I'm not going to do full prime factorization because that, like, that's NP complete hard whatever. Yeah, that's right. That's not, that's not a quantum computer. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's just a qubit of it. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, all right, you're not going to do, we don't going to do... I, 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 we, can, we can do this, so... Um, that's okay, we this, can just skip ahead to RSA because that's probably going to take a little Yeah, bit. yeah, yeah. All right, uh, take us back, please, to number one. Do we switch this? Switch monitors, please. There we are. Okay, so as I explained, prime factorization is the secret sauce uh, to RSA. This is what uh, the team figured out how to do. And they actually used a few other bits of math where I am going to wave my arms and just point at this lovely person, Eli, who understands the math. Uh, if you want to talk to, talk to them about the, the Euler's, Euler's, excuse me, Euler's totient and all the things that go into it, we're going to get into this in a second. Um, but the basic of it is elegant and simple. And the idea is that it takes a very, 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 very long time if you have two primes, or excuse me, if you have a semi-prime to figure out what the two primes that made it. And so that's what keeps this virtually unbreakable. So this is all we need for RSA. We have two primes, first and second, which is P and Q. The semi-prime is N, that's your public key. E is a random exponent, and they need this for the math, and it's actually like 3, 9,007, and 65,537. It doesn't matter, probably can know about this, so it's usually just a standard number. And then we get to D, and that's where I'm kind of just gonna jazz hands my way through that <laughs> and just say it's tough math. But can we just trust that it works? <laughs> this is it. This is the RSA algorithm. Isn't this, isn't this fine? Or this is part one of the RSA algorithm, I should say. This is how you encrypt with it. C is the ciphertext. That's your garbled up stuff. This is, again, a one-way function. M is your plain text message. Now, these are, of course, turned into numbers in the, in the, in the background or into byte arrays. Uh, anyway, you raise M to E. E is that, that standard public number, which is the generator, that I, or excuse me, the exponent I talked about, 65,537. And then you mod it by the public key, N. That's it. Isn't it crazy? And that's easy, um, as based on Diffie-Hellman. Decrypting RSA, this is where the fun comes in, and this was the breakthrough. They figured out this number D, which uses Euler's totient. And all I know about this so far is that it gives you what's called a multiplicative inverse. And what that means is that there exists a number, I have a number five, there exists a number when multiplied times five turns it into one. And anyway, all I know is it's a secret sauce to unwinding it. This is the second one-way function to decrypt. Eli's kind of wriggling because you're wrong. <laughs> oh, that's okay. If I'm wrong, I wriggle away. You need both P and Q to get the Euler totient function. Right. And then you need that number in order to get D, which is the multiplicative inverse of E mod phi. See? Yay! Uh, would you like to come up here? <laughs> I told you I was going to arm wave. So here, is this right? <laughs> Why is there a one there? I don't know. Oh, one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, one more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. All right, so at least I got this part right. So if any math geeks out there want to do this, oh boy, sweating just a little bit. Okay. Make us RSA? Yeah. So this time I'm going to completely cheat because I originally wrote the, you know, a lot of the code that um, I've. One second. Switch monitors, please. There we go. A lot of the code I prepped. Um, I did from just the specification, as it were. But for this one, Rob gave me some JavaScript that I converted into uh, C Sharp because I do not understand the maths. My favorite thing about Euler isn't like the totient stuff, but Euler's identity, which is the most beautiful um, formula in maths of e to the i pi plus one equals zero. It's like, that is just the most amazing thing <laughs> um, for any actual you know, real maths purist that's got all the constants, it's just gorgeous. Um, I'm glad to see I'm not alone on this. <laughs> However, Cambridge math base, um, for the purposes of this, so we're going to, this is now, even though this is copy pasted code, this is untested because previously I had hard coded P and Q to a couple of fairly small primes. Okay. I'm now getting the 110th prime and the 120th prime, okay. which my guess is they're in the range of like between 1,000 and 10,000. I don't know the density of primes, but 
Like, we'll, we'll find out. Elon um, So we'll then get our semi-prime of n, mm -hmm. and then we'll need to uh, find r, which is we subtract one from each of them, and then find e and d um, as per the uh, formula that Rob showed before. And after all of that, we can have a message, which is again just a number, and I really will come back to it this time. Mm -hmm. um, just a number, and we can encrypt by raising the message to our magic e value, mm -hmm. um, mod n, or remainder n, where n is the, the semi-prime, and then we can decrypt it again by raising it to the other one. So that's where the whole inverse multiplication thing yep. comes, that raising it to the opposite thing. Um, it's almost a power inverse rather than a mul multiplicative in inverse. Um, and the actual code to find D&D, &D, this is what I definitely wanted to copy. Um, we're going through a bunch of candidate stuff, and depending on how fast that is, who knows whether this will work. But let's give it a try. So let's see how big the primes that we're looking at are. OK, so they're smaller than I thought, uh, but apparently too big for finding E and D, because it hasn't printed anything. Did I? Yeah, I, I should have printed. Uh, so I'm going to temporarily at least go back to 491 and I think it was 499. Yeah, the other way around, but that's fine. There we go. And now we do get the encrypted value is a much bigger value mm -hmm. than the uh, original message, and we managed to decrypt it. So I have no idea why it failed with even slightly smaller numbers. Um, I don't know. And at this point, I'd blame, blame Rob, because this is just porting code <laughs> Rob's version. The JavaScript uh, worked. OK. Yeah, it should only have been looping. It should be uh, really, you should. Try using floats. <laughs> 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 but I do want to go back, like swiftly moving on the my code doesn't really work properly. Um, I want to go back to, this is like getting a single number. Mm -hmm. Now, you could, if you were trying to send a, a film or something, like that's a gigabyte, you could regard that one gigabyte as a very, very, very large number. And we could do that. But then we'd be raising that very large number to E, which is also quite large. Yeah. And that means, no, that's just infeasible. So how do we go from being able to do this for a single number smallish number to a whole st encryption stream. Yeah, well, these folks down here would be able to answer that better, but I do know it's a combination of encryption algorithms. It's AES, is that one? RSA plus AES to do big files, yeah? Yeah, you use, you use asymmetric encryption to get a shared key, and then you use that for asymmetric encryption. That's right. right. So yeah, the key is, yeah, the key is. So this, this is, again, not really, is this, is it fair to say this isn't, really encrypting the message. It's encrypting it's the, another it's key. key. Like there's keys upon keys upon keys. Really it, yeah. yeah, getting gradually more useful. Um, and then when we've got a key that we can do bite-wise stuff, yeah. it's, it's simpler. Yep. And the reason for that is this is phenomenally expensive. Yeah. Aha. Whereas AES and other things are computationally cheap. So you do the expensive thing once to agree on a shared key. That's large that's enough to be. For all the rest of the message. Yeah. Right, just to repeat what Kevin was saying, this is not to try to take Kevin, uh, um, Kevin's credit, it's all Kevin. Um, the, this bit that's on, on screen now is really computationally expensive, so you only want to do that once per actual message or whatever, then you do the other part of symmetric uh, sorry, asymmetric encryption that once we've got the key of an appropriate size with appropriate properties, we can then cheaply do on a you know, per byte basis and encrypt the rest of it. Okay, so it's uh, like encryption or cryptography in general tends to not be I will do one thing so much as I will chain together four or five different techniques. Yep. Um, not because of the, it's not security through obscurity of, oh, well, if I'm doing four things, that's clearly going to be secure where three wouldn't, but they're achieving slightly different goals. Yeah? Cool. Can we switch back? Very good to have fact checkers in the audience. Oh, I love it. This is great. It's great. Oh, good. 
So this is interesting. Imagine you're sitting in MIT on this team, and you, you're a research assistant or something, and they're jumping around saying, we found it, we figured it out, but how do they know? Right? How do they know that it works? All they knew back then was that prime factorization was difficult. Uh, but they didn't know how difficult it was. I mean, it wasn't really that well-researched. Um, this QR code, by the way, is a link to a YouTube video on a channel called Numberphile, which is one of my favorites. Anyway, it's uh, Ron Rivest talking about how they crowd-tested RSA using this thing called RSA-129. And what they did is they came up with this 129-bit public key, which you can see here is R. Um, and then they have the, the exponent, the um, E, is 9007. And they said, OK, go for it. You have all you need to know. Try and decrypt this message. And if you do, you'll get $100. And so it's kind of this intellectual challenge. That's RSA-129, and it's really funny. And the team thought, well, it'll take 40 quadrillion years. That's how long it's going to take. And they, they actually guessed that was their guess, to, to factor this large 129-bit primary key, or a primary key, a public key. Uh, does anybody have a guess as to how long it took? Yes? You don't have to factor the number to decrypt that one specific message. Oh. Do plain text attacks. Mm. Plain text attacks? Yeah, so if you know how to encrypt certain plain text, you can encrypt it and see if it appears somewhere, in, like not exactly, but you can use your knowledge of what certain things are oh, to, okay. to gain information about that specific message. Uh -huh. Not in general, but that specific message. And this goes back, so Eli you know, was saying, uh, if, you, you, if you know some examples of plain text, then you can get more information and maybe try to crack a single encrypted message, even if you can't crack, in general, cheaply. Right. Um, and this goes back to the Enigma machine. One of the other mistakes that Germany made, or it's not even so much a mistake, but the, um, the naval commanders would send the current weather. And in places, there were some parts of the world where the weather was the same day after day after day after day. And if you know that the same text is being sent day after day after day, that gives you a lot of information to yeah. try to, like, it's like um, scrubbing off a few of the Sudoku yeah. numbers. I, it, yeah. it may not give you the number straight away, but it makes the rest of it an awful lot easier. Yeah, well, it's the other half of uh, encryption. The other half is decryption or decrypting, which is almost as fun, or more fun, actually, I think. Well, anyway, they, the team thought 40, 40 quadrillion years. Uh, it's, I'm glad you brought that up, Eli, because it actually only took 17 years. Um, and Ron Rivas, they, they were shocked, by the way. The RSA team were completely shocked. Um, they thought that they had messed up, but 17 years is 17 years. And the funny thing is, is he said, well, we could count on computers getting faster, but we couldn't count on algorithms and the cleverness of people trying to decrypt things. And so their answer to this was, let's just make the numbers bigger. Let's make these, these, these big fat primes bigger. Which is interesting, because now we talk about the modern day, RSA is still in use, plus RSA-ish algorithms. They use these large prime-based public keys. And you got to wonder, like, computers are getting faster, but we're also getting better algorithms. Like, Shor's algorithm is used to do uh, uh, factorization, and there's another one called Regev's, I think. If, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but they're able now to do factorization better and faster, and all they need is a faster machine. Uh, does anybody recognize this thing? A quantum computer. Yep, this is a quantum computer. Do you know where, Eli, do you know where this is? No. Yeah, I... I that looks like the one from Deus. De yeah. I don't know. I, uh, Google, Google's got one that they're working on. Anyway, the quantum computers are fast. Um, and if you've ever heard the term quantum supremacy, uh, it basically means that these quantum computers, once they're able to solve a problem, a hard problem, but a reasonably hard problem, faster than a regular computer, um, or let's say what a regular computer can't solve, that's when quantum supremacy is going to occur. And a lot of people are looking at RSA algorithms and cracking RSA keys uh, as a challenge that these quantum computers could break. And right now, the idea is that they think you can do it in 100 days or less. And even then, they are thinking, well, the algorithms that they, they could use, they might even be able to do it in a day or even hours. It's, what's that? 10,000 qubits. We're, we're that's a lot of qubits. Yeah, that's so, so, yeah. OK, fair enough. But it's still a race, basically, to get yeah. quantum proof encryption yeah. before quantum decryption is feasible. Well, here's the question, though, and this is the thing that I, I think about also a lot. Is it in the post? <laughs> Fair enough. All right. 
It was the thing that the thing that I that I think though is if the government's doing the quantum computing, right, and they do crack it, would you know about it? And and you wouldn't. And that's that's not to end on a downer, but that is like an interesting <laughs> thing to think about as we go forward to the future, because we have. Uh, we have lived with RSA and like algorithms that have kept us safe and private and <laughs> encrypted, but that's not always going to be the case. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, that's it for us. Um, please, please leave us the rating. That's how we know how to get better, whether you like this talk or not, whether I should invite Skeet back or not. <laughs> I would try doing the exact same thing, but with ChatGPT, <laughs> just ChatGPT. Thanks. Uh, it's party time. Uh, again, thanks for coming so much. Appreciate it. And thank you guys. Thank you. I appreciate it.